Hello Datuk Mac. How are you Datuk Magiran? I'm good. I'm good. Yes sir. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How how's uh it's how's life during this MCO and all? Pretty good. <laughs> Pretty good. Uh as safe and sound. Uh we have been adhering uh the MCO SOPs and all. Okay, okay. As you can see here at the back of me, something familiar. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, uh, sir, you, you, you look more or more like an outdoor guy than I am. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a special for you today, having you here on board. So, friends, uh, today we have Datuk Magindran here. He's actually the first man from Malaysia to touch his foot on the peak of Mount Everest, right? Uh, back in 1997, 23 May, right? And uh, there's a, you know, the, as we were chatting, there's a lot of stories, a uh, lot of pain, a lot of struggle, and a lot of triumph uh, in climbing this whole story. So we are here to hear uh, Datuk Mac, Datuk Magindran, uh, to, who is going to share a lot of his stories uh, of uh, how he and his team uh, did this climb. Right. Uh, if you are here, if you are seeing this, you know, just drop a hi, hello to Dato Magindran so that he knows that you are around. And also, don't forget to share your comments, your questions uh, here so that he can help to answer later on in our conversation. Conversation that matters. All right. Uh, Dato Magindran, how are you doing again? I'm good. I'm good. Good, huh? Okay, yeah. so today we are here to hear a lot of your stories uh, that you have shared again with me earlier. Uh, it, I found it like super inspiring, you know, like uh, I was uh, looking at the TV live. We are all watching with the whole family uh, when you and uh, Datu Mohan Das uh, climbed and said, you know, we are here at the peak with uh, and you shared that with Dr. Mahate at that point of time. Okay, that's right. Yeah, so today we have here, let me just share with you, Royal Safe. I salute these guys. Fantastic. Anita, Glory. Hello, Anita. Uh, Rekha, uh, Sat Satnandan, Satyanandan, uh, Raja Suresh, uh, Paris, Subramaniam. All say hello. Uh, all right. Okay, so maybe we can just start. Uh, with a little bit about, you know, the background. What made you actually start, you know, wanting to climb this, you know, such a difficult mountain? Dato Magin. Right. Um, it all started uh, back in 1986 when I first set foot my... I set my foot on uh, Gunung Dato, which is in Rambau Negris Milan. So that was my first climb. And uh, it was uh, 884 meters in height. So when I was standing on the summit of Mount Dato, I told myself that I'm going to climb another mountain higher. So I went on and on. Uh, uh, after Dato, I wanted to climb Tahan, which is the highest in Peninsular Malaysia. But before climbing Gunung Tahan, I had to climb a few other mountains in, in Peninsular Malaysia to prepare myself. And uh, eventually, a year later, I climbed Mount Tahan. Then after reaching Mount Tahan, it was a very difficult mountain at the time. It, it still is. I told myself, I'm not going to stop now. I'm going to climb another mountain higher. And I set my mind to climb the highest in Malaysia, which is uh, Gunung Kinabalu. And it took me a while, a few years, uh, in 1993. That was my first time climbing Uh, Mount Kinabalu, and I told myself, if I can climb Mount Kinabalu, I can stop climbing. But when I reached the top of Mount Kinabalu, I told myself, no, I'm not going to stop now. I need to <laughs> climb that mountain higher. So I kept on going until finally I managed to climb Mount Everest. So it wow. was one uh, mountain after another. So from Mount Kinabalu, you straight away attempted uh, Mount Everest after that, or did you climb other mountains around there? I climbed uh, many other mountains. Because Mount Kinabalu was in 1990, my first time climbing Mount Kinabalu. I've, I've climbed Mount Kinabalu more than 20 times now. Uh, but 93 was my first climb. 
and after that i climbed uh, many other mountains before i got a chance to be a part of the malaysia everest 97 project because after after 93 my climbing partners at the time they had other things to do see they they had other priorities in life so i was left alone so that's when i found uh, this person who i met uh, during one of the climbs in negeri sembilan i was climbing um, gunung angsi and at the end of the climb i was just sitting there resting and i met a total stranger so he was talking to me about climbing and about a uh, mountain conservation program in malaysia and eventually yeah. i got to know that he was the president of malaysian mountaineering association oh and uh, he happens to at that time I live in the same uh, taman that I am right now. Right. So so we became friends and invited me to join the Malaysian Mountaineering Association. I became a member of the uh, association and from then on uh, I kept on climbing because new found friends with a lot of climbing uh, programs you know by the association and that's when I knew that the association already had plans to climb Mount Everest. Right? So they have already made all the groundworks to climb Everest uh, by then. So when I was there, I was very active in the association as a member, as, as well as an ESCO member of the association. And when the project kick started, I joined the project. So that's okay. how it happens. Right, right. So it started all from a simple mount, simple mount in Malaysia. Uh, and then you went that's on right. to Gurung Tahan. So some uh, Raja Suresh said here that Gunung Tahan is actually a much harder climb, right? Uh, is yes. it really hard? Some people say it's harder than Mount Kinabalu, right? In terms of uh, climbing difficulty, although it's lower than Mount Kinabalu. That's right. Uh, Tahan is definitely uh, any time harder than Mount Kinabalu because uh, the time when I climbed Mount Tahan, there was only one route from Kuala Tahan right to the peak of Mount Tahan and back to Kuala Tahan. now they have another route uh, which is marapo this an, uh, and that is a shorter route to the peak so the distance between uh, the distance from kuala tahan to the peak it's about 55 kilometers one way so if you are doing gunung tahan from kuala tahan to the peak and back to kuala tahan it's about 110 kilometers and it will okay. take uh, approximately 7 uh, days right seven days seven up days. and down yeah seven days up and down okay where where else uh mount kinabalu it's about 8.6 kilometers one way right so in pro it's about 16 north kilometers all right 16 uh, 17.2 kilometers to and fro so you can right. compare the distance of course yeah, mount tahan is higher twice higher almost twice higher than gunung tahan but the distance that we need to travel into the jungle to get right. to the peak of mount tahan it's it's actually treacherous treacherous yes. uh, and 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 uh, actually mount tahan uh, mount kinabalu it's it's uh, it's a tourist mountain right you know it's 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 uh, you know you have all the facilities there you don't even have to carry anything people are there right. the porters are there to carry everything for you you know we can just walk without carrying just just with the walking stick we can go up where else right. uh, mount han we need to carry all the stuff ourselves and we need to carry all the food items and right. we need to keep, you know it's like you you trek for 8 hours a day when, when you reach the campsite you know you have to we have to pitch our tents uh, we have to wash ourselves we have to prepare the dinner and then you know and then we need to wash our clothes you know all that we need to do but on mount kinabalu we don't have to do all that as soon as we reach the rest house at 11000 feet above sea level you know the food is just ready a buffet <laughs> lunch buffet yes. dinner is just ready so so that is the comparison between tahan and kinabalu so that's why you really need to be tahan lah really need to tahan yeah, right. yeah, in your climbing right. <laughs> <laughs> okay so how long did it actually take let's talk about uh, the everest climb right how long did it uh, take for you and your team to start planning for this climb in 1997 okay the uh, a group of uh, climbers from malaysia it's a group of climbers all right so they um 
they went to Nepal to climb a mountain called Mount Kalapatha. Okay. Back in 1983. Back in 1983. Right. So, uh, 83 December. So, in January 1984, 12 out of 16 climbers managed to summit Mount Kalapatha. Mount Kalapatha, it's about 18,000 feet above sea level. Right. So when this group of climbers came back to Malaysia, so they came back with a vision. That is to prepare a team from Malaysia to climb Mount Everest 10 years from then. So what they did was uh, when they came back to Malaysia, some of them, uh, they formed the Malaysian Mountaineering Association in right. 1986. Right. Okay. And then in 1988, mm. they signed a memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Youth and Sports to jointly undertake the Malaysia Everest 97 project. Right. And, uh, uh, and they also paid some money to the Nepal authorities to book a route to climb Everest in 1997. So okay. uh, that, that, was the, that was the procedure then. You know, if, if, if anyone intends to climb Everest, they need to make a booking very much in advance. Right. But these days, it is not like that anymore. You know, you want to climb Mount Everest next year, you just you just make the arrangement this year and you can just go. Because right. uh, climbing Everest has become highly commercialized uh, in Nepal uh, these days. But it, it, it wasn't the case then. So um, they made the booking very, very, very much earlier. And uh, due to financial constraint, they could not kickstart the project almost immediately. So they had to wait for some years. They only started... Uh, planning to climb Everest sometime in the end of 1994. Okay. So, and then uh, they started um, advertising uh, in the club's bulletin about the Everest climb and uh, they started gathering as many members as possible who wishes to be a part of the training program. So, uh, and in uh, Initially, they had about 120 applicants who wanted to join the project. Uh, after much discussions and meetings and shortlistings, about 50 odd climbers were shortlisted to for the first training program, right. which was done in, on Mount Kinabalu. So that okay. was my second climb, actually. So, the, but this time, uh, the climb to Mount Kinabalu was uh, very different. Uh, we were taken up, we went up to Mount Kinabalu and uh, we were required to uh, camp at an altitude of 12,500 meters okay. on the mountain right. and we stayed there for about a week okay. and uh, we did, uh, we, uh, we did uh, altitude training, uh, we did other rock climbing programs, we went through uh, rope management courses and, and uh, just basically uh, try and live at that altitude. Okay. Right. At the end of and at the end of that training program, many gave up. Some fell sick, you know. Some decided that you know even uh, decided uh, not to go on with the program anymore. So when we came back to Kuala Lumpur, there were another shortlisting uh, took place, and uh, about thirty climbers were shortlisted for the following right. program. Right. Uh, that was uh, that was our first ice uh, ice exposure in uh, northern part of india so we were okay. all taken to uh, taken to a place uh, called kulu manali right. in the state of machal pradesh in india yes and we were attached to the uh, uh, manali institute of mountaineering and allied sports at the time so we were taken into the mountains and uh, we were in the mountains uh, for about 33 days 33 days we were exposed to all sort of ice, ice uh, climbing uh, trainings. That was my first ever exposure uh, to, to uh, snow and ice climbing. Uh, it, was, uh, initially it was tough, of course, because it was my first uh, ever exposure at, you know, in, in, in that kind of environment. So we managed to climb up to 18,000 feet at the time. Okay. After, the pro uh, after the training program, we came back. We came back to Kuala Lumpur and there, uh, there was another shortlisting and about 25 members were selected. Some, some fell sick when we were in India uh, and some gave up. They said that this is just too much for me. I don't think I can go on. 
see so that's how that's how and and of course uh, we we went through uh, two years of uh, short listings and other team building programs uh, we even uh, we, we were even sent to the military camps in uh, Kuala Lumpur Baru and also in Sungai Udang uh, where we were uh, you know the the, the army personnel uh, facilitated the team building program uh, to to bring us all together because uh, teamwork is extremely important in this kind of expedition uh, of course there were there were members who were very very strong in fact some of them are extremely experienced and strong but unfortunately they could not work with the team right so so they were not selected even in right. the end right so this are the things and uh, the whole training program uh, was about slightly more than 2 years and uh, in 1996 in december 1996 the sports minister at the time tan sri muhyiddin yasin announced the final 10 climbers who would uh, take up the everest challenge and to bring up the malaysian flag to the uh, to the highest mountain in the world right so what did it take to qualify for that to be in part of the 10 uh, who finally uh, you know were shortlisted right uh, we we went through um, many physical uh, training programs uh, physical tests and then we were also sent for um, uh, lab testing as well to to check on our uh, oxygen present in the body and also the hemoglobin contained in the blood because uh, when we have more hemoglobin then uh, you know there's more oxygen in the, in, in the body so uh, there are a lot of tests took place All right besides that uh, we were also climbing many other mountains you know as part of our training program okay we we established our own logbook then we uh, we present the logbook to the committee the selection committee members and uh, we will have discussions uh, every now and then so based on all based on all the 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 the, the training program that we went through for two years you know they sort of uh uh I, I do not know what was the uh, what was the point system that was given to each climber by the by the uh, selection committee members, but uh, we could see, you know, as as we were training, as we were progressing, as uh, we were climbing at high altitude, uh, the local instructors, you know, when when uh, uh, when we were training in India at the end of the training program, the local instructors from India who trained us. they sent a confidential report to the selection committee in kuala lumpur similarly when we were training in new zealand the the local trainers there they also sent confidential report to the selection committee members uh, in kuala lumpur so based on all these reports and based on the report uh, which was produced by the military camps see eventually uh, finally uh, they selected the a team uh that would be uh best to accomplish the mission right right so this is like a very very thorough selection process uh, to to be selected as the final 10 who qualified uh, to start climbing right that's right because it is the first of its kind in Mal- for malaysia uh it, it you know many millions of dollars uh, many millions of ringgit uh spent on the project and uh, they wanted to make sure that you know we come back successfully so the the the, the selection process was stringent it was uh, professionally done uh, you know they had uh, members from the association they had members from various other government departments including the ministry of youth and sports to to wet through the selection process to make sure that you know uh, they send the best team to nepal right. because right. because uh, of course uh, there were critics international uh, internationally right. that the malaysians inexperienced and you know it's a, it's a suicide machine uh, mission and so on <laughs> right. so so uh, the the selection committee uh, they were careful with this and they wanted to make sure that you know they send the best team right to for the mission 
Yeah, I'm sure because he's like, uh, it, it will be a suicide mission if you you all are not prepared, right, for something like this. Right. So it, it uh, and you all got selected in the year 1990? 1996, 20, 28th December 1980, uh, sorry, 28th December 1996, the right. announcement. <clears throat> That was just about five to six short months before the actual climb, right? Right. They had to, uh, they had to announce uh, in December 1996 so that, you know, uh, we can uh, continue with the, the, the final selected uh, members can go through the final training uh, phase, uh, which was right. also held in India. Right, so that was right. a winter climb. So we were sent uh, uh, in uh, once, as soon as the final an announcement uh, was made, uh, the, the selected members were sent to India. Right. Uh, for two weeks. Uh, and that was during winter. And okay. the snow and the, and the snow in the town of Manali was about three feet on the road. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So we were there. We were there. And uh, luckily, we got out of the mountains uh, in time to travel back to Kuala Lumpur. Otherwise, we would have been there. <laughs> we would have been there. We would have stuck there for months. Yeah, Manali is such a beautiful place, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. They they call it the Switzerland of the East. Yeah, that's the, the streams and the, and the snow. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so like from that point onwards, right? What did you all do to start the whole process of actually climbing uh, the mount? What did you all start doing? You know, what did you all start preparing? Uh, and how did you go on about it? See, the training part was one thing. Right. So we, uh, we, we trained, you know, the, we, the, the com selection committee. Uh, in the selection committee, they, they had uh, a co communication director. They had um, a training uh, program director. So the training, training program director came up with a, with a periodization plan. You know, what are the things that we need to do, you know, throughout our training phase and all? Because this, these are some of the things uh, uh, that we, as climbers, uh, you know, we were doing. But on the other hand, you know, uh, it, it's not like today. Uh, we, can, uh, we can find almost anything on internet. Right. We want, we, we want to climb Everest, you know, the, the, all the information are already there. You know, you just need to Google. But back then... Uh, Google was not there yet. Yes. <laughs> no, uh, Google was, uh, wasn't established. So yes. we cannot just find for information in the Google. We can no no Wikipedia, no Google, nothing. Right. Okay. They had this. Uh, so we need to find information. Uh, we uh, And you cannot just walk into any store and buy uh, climbing gears in, in Kuala Lumpur. Right. We cannot do that. You see? So, uh, but the, the, there were agents. You know, there were agents, uh, outdoor agents. Uh, we need to uh, pre-order. We need to pre-order and they need to purchase the items for us, you know, through their, uh, their, their contacts elsewhere. Right. All right. Uh, these days, you know, if, if, you, if you are planning to climb a mountain, you can just walk into, you know, any mall and you can, you can just purchase. Yeah. Uh, uh, Climbing, uh, you know, uh, trekking boots or, or right, fleece right. jacket, you know, all, yes. all the all sorts of things. You can almost get anything here, but it yes. wasn't like that. So we right. need to we need to sit, we need to plan, uh, we need to. If we are planning to look for items in US, we had to stay awake because the time the, the the time difference is twelve hours. Right. Right. So we 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 need to stay awake and we need to make a call in the middle of the night to either Europe or US. You know, to, to find order, for to make the orders, right? Yeah, to either to make order or to inquire about the price. You see? Wow. So, so these are the things that uh, uh, the other the other things that we need to do. Uh, right. Yeah. Every item, you know, every item was ordered. It was a painstaking process to order each and every item that we had during our expedition. Right. Right. So. Uh, these are some of the things that went through at the background while the climbers were training, right? So uh, eventually, uh, once we got all the items, some of the items were shipped directly to Kathmandu, not to Kuala Lumpur, to save right. costs. Right. Right. Uh, so so we only uh, we we could only check the items at Kathmandu and not in Kuala Lumpur. 
<laughs> so we had to wow. we had to uh, spend a days and night you know going through the the checklist of the items that we purchased uh, and of course there's one uh, local um, uh, sports supplier who who also uh, helped us a lot right U- universal fitness and sports right they helped us to purchase a lot of items right so uh, we need to uh, go through the list uh, pack everything and then and then we had to take it with us to Kathmandu so when we were in Kathmandu we had to unpack the entire packages you know to recheck and re and, and then we repack the whole thing all right so that uh, you know we repacked in a in a in a in a different way so that it can be easily transported to the base camp so while we were in Kathmandu the weather was not so good we were supposed to fly into the mountains on the 10th of march the weather was so bad so we could only we we only flew into uh a place called lukla okay that's uh, all trekking starts from lukla so from kathmandu it's about 45 to 1 hour flight if you uh, we took a we took a huge helicopter to fly into lukla right right if if you're flying in uh, if if you're using a twin otter then uh, it it's about 40 40 minutes or to 45 minutes helicopter you know it it, it took uh, longer so So once we landed in Lukla if you, you can now you can google Lukla airport it is one of the most dangerous airports in the world so you can uh, so when we reached Luk- uh, Lukla it took us about two weeks to travel from Lukla to the base camp so we were at the base camp on the 26th March 1997 so and from from as soon as we reached base camp you know it was time to acclimatize because base camp is already 18000 feet above sea level it's about 5300 right. meters right and uh, our mount kinabalu is about 14000 so 13000 plus feet so compared yes. to base camp uh, 18000 feet you know it's it's much much higher wow and uh, we, we we had to be there for two months wow at the base camp at the base camp and 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 to the higher camps so we need to acclimatize we acclimatized and when the time was ready we started climbing so it was uh, the the whole process from the day we started training right up to the peak and back you know everything uh was carefully planned uh everything was painstakingly done and uh the whole process is an experience that i will never forget yeah yeah just a question just came in right how did you all um because it it took a lot of practice many years of preparation right how did you all sponsor yourself how did you you know because you all i'm sure you had to take time off from work and all right uh were, were you all sponsored or did you all self raise your funds how was the funding process for you all right initially the funds did not come okay okay so uh the selection committee members uh, you know we had a meeting we had a meeting and they said that you know the funds are not coming uh, we are still trying to get funds uh, from the ministry and also uh, from the private sectors but for now we cannot wait for the funds to come in yet we have to start training and to train we need to spend our own money so uh, every member of the expedition uh, they started looking looking for their own funds initially uh like like me uh i, I took a bank loan a, a small bank loan to uh, to get some of the climbing gears uh, okay initially uh others who had the cash you know they they spend their money first because um, this is this is another uh, this is another uh, thing that the selection committee members observed they wanted to see how serious we are how committed we are into this project some of them uh, you know there were others who when uh, when they heard that you know that that we need to spend our own money they just walked away they said that there's no way that i'm going to spend my money right right okay, this is a, this is a national mission and uh, it should be sponsored all the way right i say this sort of things this sort of thing so uh, many of us uh, we we wanted to climb and it is a golden opportunity 
you know it's a first of it, first of its kind and it's a golden opportunity and we do I, i personally don't want to miss the opportunity it it doesn't knock all the time so i i took the chance uh i took up a bank loan to buy my initial climbing gears and uh that and and um, eventually sponsors started coming in and that was after uh in 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 mid 1995 in mid our first climb to mount kinabalu the the club came up with some money right club came up with some money because the club already had some funds right so they, they made use of their funds but by the time we went to uh india for first ice and snow cl- uh, climbing exposure some funds came in but it was not sufficient it was only su- sufficient to to uh f- for the uh, uh training program to pay the uh, you know the uh adventure association uh, in india and 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 you know to to cover the expenses that was that incurred in india right, right. so uh but we did not have enough money to to buy our climbing gears so we rented some of it we rented some of it we bought ourselves but the one that we bought you know they are they are not of the highest quality we just bought you know just to just to make sure that you know we have something for training yeah so and and uh, uh th- those uh outfit that we had at the time uh could not withstand uh the the cold and 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 the wind chill factor that was there you know so uh but we managed we managed uh, the 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 inner uh thermal underwears that we had are also not of highest quality right i see so so uh we 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 had to make do with whatever that we had at the time and when we went to new zealand later with the same gears the new zealanders told us that you know if you are going to use this in the mountains i am not going to teach you up <laughs> you know, uh, they said that you know uh, your safety is very important health is very important you are uh, planning to climb everest but with this kind of gears there's no way we are going to take you up into the mountains right so they they said that you know uh, no uh, uh, they they rejected they rejected the you know they went through a quality control process and this you know they they told us to gather in the room in the hall okay now take out all the uh, gears that you have uh, laid down on the floor we need to check each and every piece right. so and then this is walk about and say no this no 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 <laughs> <laughs> right mostly rejected uh, so, yeah rejected they said that you know these are of no quality you know uh, so they said that we can help you Uh, to get some discount we will take you to a store here outdoor store you can purchase whatever that you want these are the items that you need to have they said these are the things that you need to have uh, for us to take you up into the mountains all right so uh, we went there on a strictly low budget and uh, when we heard this from them <clears throat> we had to call our our exp- <laughs> expedition leader and in, in Kuala Lumpur and told him that you know the president of Malaysian Mountaineering Association that you know this is what they he told us you know they will not take us into the mountains if we have this kind of gears and so they said that then he said uh, do something because i'm in Kuala Lumpur i can't help you now you have right. to do something so mm-hmm. luckily I, i you know i had my credit card and i had to use my credit <laughs> card to purchase uh, some of the items as uh, that's what happened to uh, you know the other guys who were there with me and and uh, eventually we 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 had a 29 day training in new zealand wow crazy crazy stuff huh? so a lot of lot of things uh, you all had to fund yourself uh, during the process half fund semi semi fund uh, yeah that's right because it's just because of your interest right, right. so and then um, uh, eventually the funds started coming in and uh, as far as financial was concerned it was uh, easy uh, other than that uh, about the leave you know i was lucky because i was a government servant so as a government servant i i was awarded unrecorded leave uh, just a few of us just a few of us because the uh, ministry of youth and sports spoke to all the employers government department 
government department as well as the uh, private companies about the national mission and that they should be a part of the program. Uh, some of them were given a paid leave and there were one or two. They said that, you know, we cannot afford to give you paid leave because we, are, we need you here every day for you to perform a certain task. If you are not here, then we need to take someone else and we right. need to pay that person. Right. So if you, 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 you can choose to climb or you can choose to stay and work, the choice is yours. So mm -hmm. some had to, uh, some had to resign. Right. And some had to resign their job. Some cannot afford to resign their job because of commitments. So they had to leave the project. Wow. So these were some of the things that happened. Uh, there, there, there are members who resigned earlier because they wanted to climb and eventually they were not selected to be in the program. Wow. So this is some of the sad things that happen, you know, Big which sacrifices. cannot be avoided. Right. Yeah, and they, they had to take the chance and, and do that anyway, right? Right. That's the, that's the risk that they, that they, that they took. So tell us a little bit about the climb, you know, from the base camp. Uh, you know, you were already there at the base camp two months earlier, right, before the climb. Uh, what was the process? What did you all do from that time to the climb itself? Right. Um, we reached base camp on the 26th March. Okay. And, uh, uh, and yeah, that was the first time I'm actually stepping uh, into base camp. Right, it was uh, it was like the biggest quarry in the world. It full of quarry. rocks, quarry, yeah, full of rocks. The whole place was full of rocks, boulders, wow. uh, ice and snow, nothing else. All right, there's no life, it's just barren. So uh, we had to level the rocks to pitch our tents, and then we get ourselves. You know, we need we need to start living at the base camp. There were many many other climbers from other countries as well at the base camp. So everyone, you know, some came after us. Some or, were already there when we reached the base camp. So it was a kind of an acclimatization process. So we need to get used to the environment and and, and the altitude. So we and and we had to. Uh, Recheck all the items uh, you know that we had carried to the base camp. Uh, we uh, we used about seventy odd potters, hundred odd potters, and about seventy yaks to transport wow. the entire uh, entire uh, uh, equipment and food stuff to the base camp. So there was a huge uh, kitchen tent, uh, dining tent, and other uh, smaller tents for the climbers. So it was two to a uh, two person to a tent. So we need to we need to uh, level the ground because it's very rocky. So we need to level the ground to pitch our tents, you know, to find a spot and pitch our tents. And uh, then uh, we were just walking about, you know, we were walking about, you know, climbing the little uh, hills around the base camp just to acclimatize. And uh, after some time, you know, the the the, the sherpas, you know, it is it is the uh, culture. To perform a puja at the base camp, you know, according to the uh, Buddhist rituals. Right. So they had uh, they had a priest from the nearby monastery at the base camp. In fact, many of the expeditions, you know, there were about twelve expedition uh, team uh, at the base camp, and many of the teams they they all had their puja on the same day. You know, in their respective campsites. Right. So, so uh, of course, as a, as, as a mark of respect, uh, we were all seated around uh, the altar that was built on rocks, uh, just observed what they were doing. Uh, at the end of the puja, the expedition uh, flag and the prayer flags, Nepali uh, Buddhist prayer flags were officially raised at the base camp. So it was uh, the, the, the empty base camp became so colorful that day. <laughs> you know, because every team, you know, they, they raise the, uh, the flag as well as the colorful uh, prayer flags, you know. Uh, so it became so colorful. The base camp became colorful and it was the beginning of the climb. So after the, the following day, so we started 
moving into the ice fall. Ice fall is one yeah. of the the most dangerous section right. uh, that is situated between the base camp and camp one. So right. it is uh, it is uh, loose ice boulders that is actually uh, tumbling down a steep slope from a higher ground. Right. So so one has to maneuver through these uh, ice blocks safely to get up to camp one. See so. Uh, so we were we were we were training we were climbing uh, there were aluminum ladders fixed across the ice cracks we call it the crevasse all right across the, uh, the 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 crevasse and uh, you know we were training how to cross the uh, the ice ladders the the aluminum ladders there were right. there were many aluminum ladders fixed okay the, uh, by a team called the icefall doctors Right. If you've read about the Icefall Doctors, you know this is a company uh, uh, from UK, but they use mostly uh, Nepali Sherpas to to build to to establish a route through the Icefall. Right. Otherwise, there is no route because these are all like huge uh, blocks of ice. You know, so they need to establish a route from base camp to camp one into the you know through the Icefall. So some uh, uh, some cracks are just too wide for us to jump over. So they need to fix ladders, you know, to cross over. Uh, some ladders are vertical, some ladders are horizontal, you know. But there are many many ladders. So once the route through the ice fall is established by this particular company, then the climbers can move into the ice fall and above. So uh, this took some time. Uh, this took some time. And as uh, and and every time when we climb through the ice fall and to the higher camps, we will always climb higher than the previous time, you know, just to just to test our end, uh, our endurance and also our physical condition. If we are if our body can adapt to the altitude and the atmosphere at the, uh, over there, so these were the things that we were doing. And uh, as we were climbing up and down the mountain, we were also establishing campsites. Because it's not like Mount Tahan where you just walk a trek into the jungle for about six yeah. hours and you go to an opening where you have uh, you have a campsite where you can pitch your tent. It's not like that. It is up to the individual team, all right. It is up to the individual team to establish their own campsites. All right. This is the route. Okay. This this is going to be our route, and we are going to establish four campsites. But the, there isn't a, a spot. So the 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 Indonesian's campsite can be 150 meters away from our campsite. For them, that's their Cam One, and for us, we name it Cam One. So it's like that. So in the early days, uh, when Everest, uh, you know, when they attempted to climb Everest, they had um, more than four campsites. Some even had about six campsites. They established six campsites. But these days, uh, expedition uh, members will only establish four campsites. So we had four campsites. Uh, we established three campsites, Camp 1, Camp 2, and Camp 3. Camp 4, uh, we did not go up to Camp 4 until the final day. Right. So it took us about almost a month and a half to acclimatize and also to establish all these three campsites. Right. Only the Sherpas went up to Camp 4 to establish uh, the Camp 4. So uh, that was the process of climbing towards uh, towards... Uh, camp three and above, and uh, our first summit attempt was on the first week of March. Oh, I'm sorry, on the first week of May. Our first summit attempt, but unfortunately, our first summit attempt, attempt failed due to very bad weather, and we lost one Sherpa during that climb. Oh. Right, we, we lost oh. one Sherpa. Um, we started climbing on the fifth of. May from base camp to camp two and on the sixth the weather was bad the weather was extremely bad we could not go anywhere but uh, but the Sherpas they decided to go up to camp four to supply oxygen tank you know because they need to carry the oxygen tank and leave it at camp four right so three, right. three Sherpas went up to camp four on the way down, you know, one Sherpa just slipped off the slope and oh, no. it was like all the way down, a thousand meters uh, down and uh, he landed at the base of uh, 
uh, of of Mount Lotse. Okay. Right. So uh, and uh, we established a, we established a search party, and about uh, an hour later we found his body, but he was already dead by then. And uh, we it was sad because uh, I know this guy very well. Uh, we have been uh, trekking together, you know, on our way to the base camp earlier in in May in March. So uh, when he lost his life, uh, we were sad. We were sad, and as a mark of respect, um, we told the uh, climbing Sherpa. You know, he's called the Sardar. Sardar is the climbing uh, the climbing leader among the right. Sherpas. Right. That uh, should we abandon our climb as a mark of respect? So he said no. Nothing can happen to him now. He's already dead. So uh, we put his body in a tent, and we waited for good weather, and we started climbing again. He said that we can pick his body up on the way down after summiting Everest, but unfortunately, the weather turned extremely bad after that. We could not climb. We we went up to Camp Three. The, the, the two days later, we went up to Camp Three, and we were supposed to move up to Camp Four uh, that morning, but the weather picked up, and it was extremely bed we had to hold on to the tent you know it was a rattling wow it was the, the tent was rattling you know as if it's going to be blown off from the from the slopes of mount lotse so and then uh, we got a call from the base camp saying that you know they received the weather report from uh, the tribhuvan international airport nepal and also from uh, the indian sources that the weather is going to be bad for the next 72 hours and there's no way that we can climb so they told us to abandon the climb as soon as the weather subside sub- subsided so we were holding on in our tents uh, for some time uh, there were four of us there were four of us so initially the weather was not that bad so my two other partners Uh, Gary Chong and Fauzan, they they radioed us and then they told us that you know uh, the weather looks a bit okay. Uh, I think we can go down. So they left the tent. Right. You know they they were at the they were at the neighboring tent. So they left the tent. But I told Mohan that you know I think we should wait for a while. So as soon as they left, probably not even thirty meters away, thirty meters down, the weather picked up again. The bad weather picked up again, and uh, they had to find refuge in a nearby. a foreign tent luckily right. uh, there weren't anyone in the tent because the the other climbers from other countries they have already left much right. earlier right. so they had to uh, get into this uh, other tent uh, and and we were just holding on to our tents and just waiting for the uh, you know for the weather to subside and uh, when the weather subsided we just uh, took our chances and uh, got out of the tent at base camp, at camp at camp 3 and we moved down to came to uh as 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 fast as we could and uh when we reached came to the weather was good and the sherpas decided that you know we can all move to base camp so we had this inflated stretcher that we can we can actually uh just pull it along on on the ground on the ice so we had this in, inflated stretcher so we put nima rinzi's body right so on the stretcher tied him up and we slowly dragged the stretcher down to base camp and it was one of the longest uh, journey from camp 2 to base camp because because we were actually dragging the body down so it has to so it, the movement was extremely slow and, and it took us about uh, many hours more than 8 hours to actually reach the base camp wow. so as soon as we reached the base camp i know the sherpas had a special uh, uh, prayer ceremony for uh, the late riman uh, uh, nima rinzi and um, and uh, we had a meeting then we we looked into all the weather reports from various sources and the expedition told us that you know i don't think we can climb for the next few days so now uh, the 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 season will be closed at the end of may Okay, wow. so now that of end of May by by end of May they'll close the season right and right, they will right. dismantle all the they will dismantle all the aluminum ladders that are fixed right 
you know. Uh, so once the aluminum aluminum ladders are dismantled, the climbing season is over. Right, and so, so you all were running uh, short of time already there. Yes, yes, that's right. Because we did not expect the weather to be bad that long. So since our first attempt failed, so and we were we were back at the base camp. So we had right. to uh, we had to recover completely. to make sure that you know we are full of energy we are 100% ready for the final summit attempt so we had a meeting and we decided that you know we cannot stay at the base camp to fully recover so we decided to go down to the tree lines in in the next uh, one or two days so on the 11th of may all the four of us decided to go down to the tree lines you know it was uh, Uh, there was just, below just the just above the just above a place called namchi bazaar where there are a lot of trees so we went all the way down there to rest for two days and we were told that you know wherever you go to rest make sure make sure you come back to the base camp on the 15th of may to prepare for the final summit attempt right so as as planned uh, we came back we we were back at the base camp on the 15th of may and uh, the weather was still bad on the 16th and 17th on the 18th point, of may at that point of time how many climbers were there in the malaysian team uh there were only four of us left four right yes at out the of the 10 beginning it was 10 right yeah uh, in the beginning there were 10 of us uh excluding one doctor and one rtm crew member So uh, uh yeah there's one more thing I need to tell you um a climbing permit is consists of 12 climbers right when the ministry of tourism and uh, ministry of uh, civil aviation and tourism nepal right issues a climbing permit we can right. have a maximum of 12 climbers in a team right maximum okay? a maximum of 12 climbers in a team they can have lesser right. but they cannot right. have more than 12 in in one right. climbing permit right all right so we we had 10 climbers one doctor and one rtm crew member right okay but the but the doctor managed to climb up to camp 2 because uh, all the 12 climbers were given permit to climb above base camp right of course without climbing permit they can only stay at the base camp right okay so the doctor managed to climb uh up to camp 2 while he was at camp 2 there were others who were falling sick at the base camp so right. the expedition leader decided that the doctor don't have to climb right so and, and stay put at the base camp to make sure that everyone is healthy all right and they there were three uh, rtm crew members but since we could only accommodate a one rtm crew member Right. The other two had to uh, share. the the other The other two had to, uh, sh- uh, you know, get into another expedition which had less than twelve uh, members. Right. You know, so uh, there were there were another uh, British expedition. There were only about nine or ten members in the team. Uh, so <coughs> these two uh, RTM crew members just joined the other. you know just to just to make sure that they are at the base camp with right, us right right so uh, so that's what happened so when we were acclimatizing from base camp to camp 2 and uh camp 3 one after another members uh, of our malaysian team gave up right you know gave up right so all the 10 climbers all the 10 climbers the rtm crew members and the doctor managed to reach camp 2 right after camp 2 uh two members gave up right two uh right. two members four members gave up okay there were only six of us after right. camp 2 members gave up there were only six of us right all right and these six members managed to reach up to camp 3 Right at camp three, another two gave up. Right. So there were four. Okay. So so there were only four. So during our first summit attempt, there were four of us. 
and during our final summit attempt, there were four of us. Right. So, so the, the, it was the same four. Uh, yeah, the same four. Yeah. Right. So what so, what actually made uh, some of the team members give up uh, during you know in, in various phases in the climb? Okay, the first uh, the first uh, casualty was our only lady member. Mm -hmm. Okay, she had uh, she had some problems with the uh, archery tendon. Right. Right, and then um, uh, and then the other um, the other members they also had some health issues. Uh, health issues, uh, breathing problems, uh, you know, um, not well. Uh, one member was uh, just coughing non-stop. You know, he was just coughing non-stop until he heard uh, he had injured his, uh, uh, you know, the lower part of his uh, rib cage. Right, right, right. Uh, because of uh, uh, too much coughing. Yeah. Okay, that sort of thing, and then uh, you know it's 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 uh, it's a very harsh uh, condition at the base camp. Yes. Uh, you know sometimes the the temperature is uh, way below zero. You know, and and and, and the, the the wind is so cold, and we need to breathe that very cold air into our lungs. You know, and so so it's it's not an easy thing uh, to be there for a prolonged period of time. So. Uh, that condition has caused a lot of health issues among members, including me, including, uh, in fact, all of us had some kind of uh, issue, you know, uh, health issues, but we, pre we somehow managed to recover faster than the others, right? So uh, it, this happens in every team, uh, every member, even the Sherpas go through these kind of difficulties, right? right. So at the end of the day, it's, um, it's about, uh, recovery who recovers faster so i was probably lucky in the sense that you know uh, just the four of us you know we although we fell sick in between but we recovered in time you know to to climb up to the summit right it's it's it must be really really tough and did you uh, on your own right did, did you have feelings of like giving up at any point of time before you know, the final summit? Of course, we were faced with a lot of difficulties, a lot of odds <clears throat> in terms of weather. Okay, we see um, climbers uh, dying. Uh, of course, one is uh, Nima Rinzi, you know, who fell to his death. And then there was this uh, British expedition leader who, who just died at the base camp in the sleep. Oh, no. uh, we have uh, seen uh, Sherpas just falling into the crevasse, uh, oh. injuring themselves, you know, being rescued, you know, uh, being uh, heavily lifted, evacuated from the base camp. Uh, and we have seen a lot of uh, other issues, internal issues. Uh, the Japanese team, you know, the probably the most sophisticated a well-prepared team at the base camp. Uh, they had some internal issues and they just decided to pack up and leave. Oh, no. A lot of things. All right. So, uh, so, but uh, there were 180 climbers at the base camp uh, that year with only one goal. That is to go up to the summit. Right. So everyone, uh, you know, each and every one of us, we were positive. Uh, we always sit and discuss of how to overcome, uh, uh, deal with issues and come up with solutions, always positive solutions. So it, it was, uh, it was a positive aura all around us, you know, with only one, one thing in our minds that is to climb up to the summit of Mount Everest. Uh, it wasn't uh, me. It wasn't Mohan. It wasn't uh, Gary or it wasn't Fauzan or anyone else. It's about, the flag, the Malaysian flag being on top of Mount Everest. Uh, that was what was in our mind at the time. Okay, and, and that's the reason why we were there for in the first place. To make sure that, you know, it's a teamwork and we work together to make sure that, you know, the national flag flies on the summit of Mount Everest. So that was the, the goal. And uh, we, you know, we sang uh, the national anthem every morning at the base camp. Wow. You know, uh, we, uh, we will have a roll call. You know, at a certain time, 
every morning, every time when we were at the base camp, you know, uh, we do that. You know, roll call. Uh, so uh, then uh, we'll sing the national anthem at the base camp. Okay, so to, to keep our spirits high at all times. So uh, we never had, I never had the thought of uh, giving up. We, you know, we, we did everything that we could to make sure that, you know, we, uh, we, uh, we look forward to climb the mountain. Even though I, I had an injured knee at the time, you know, I had some uh, gastric issues because of the food, but uh, I managed to overcome all this with the help of the doctor as well as uh, team members. So how was your final ascent to the summit? Uh, you know, after you know all these things, you all had to go down, you know, after the first trial, you came back down, you know, injuries, death in the team. And then how was the final ascent? Right. As I mentioned to you earlier, uh, we were back at the base camp on the 15th. Right. So uh, the weather was still bad. We, um, we held on at the base camp on the 16th, just uh, recovering uh, and, and just doing other stuff, uh, drying our socks and uh, the, the, the thermal underwears, you know, by the fire. And uh, on the 18th of May, the weather was good. Right? The weather was good. And we also got a report from uh, our Indian partners in India. Uh, that we have to make sure that, you know, we leave the mountain by the 27th of May. Because after the 27th of May, the weather is going to be extremely bad. So whether, uh, you know, whatever happens, we have to summit before the 27th and leave the mountain by then. We have to be down. So, uh, and that was our only shot. And everyone was, uh, you know, praying to make sure that, you know, we accomplish our mission. So on the 18th morning, at about 5 a.m., most of us were already at the at the edge of the icefall, you know, uh, fastening our crampons. Crampons are the, the the spikes that are fitted to our ice boots. Right. right? So we were there, and then um, at the icefall, of course, as usual, uh, uh, there was some prayer recital. And then uh, we moved. Of course, uh, during our acclimat acclimatization period, we will climb from base camp to camp one, and then we'll put up a night at camp one, and then from camp one, we move on to camp two. But after going up and down several times, uh, and uh, once we are used to the terrain, uh, we can speed our process of climbing, speed up our process of climbing, and we don't have to stay at camp one anymore. Camp one will just, we will just leave one tent at the campsite just for any emergency purposes right right so otherwise uh, we will not put up at camp one we will climb all the way straight to camp two because right. we can do it in six hours right. from base camp to camp two we can do it in six hours right so there were six of us six of us we left the base camp and we climbed towards camp two uh four climbers and two support crew right uh, they were placed at camp two they were based at Camp 2 at the time, just to make sure that, you know, they, uh, they take turns to, uh, to be at the radio base. Just in case if there's any communication issues, then uh, they can relay the message from Camp 2 to, to the base camp. Right. Because uh, when we were at the higher camps, we cannot communicate direct to those who are at the base camp. Right. We have to, uh, but those people who are at Camp 2 can, can hear us. Right. So, and they will right. relay the message to base camp. So, right. for that purpose, we needed to have another two climbers at the camp, at the at camp too. Wow. So much to, to, Yeah. So, we had one radio base at camp one, uh, at base camp and another radio base at camp two. Right. Just in case. Right. So, uh, Major Mama Rizan and also Borhan Ibrahim. Right. Uh, they were at camp two. Together with Murthy. Together with Murthy Maniam. He was also there. At, at camp two. So there were there were seven of us. There were seven of us. We left uh, base camp and uh, we reached, the four of us reached camp two. 
Mohan, uh, Gary, Fauzan, and myself, we reached Camp 2 first. All right. Uh, and um, probably an hour or so later, uh, Major Mohamed Rizan joined us at Camp 2. But oh. the other two, but the other two, they could not keep up with us. So they had to halt at Camp 1. And they only joined us the next morning. So they, that was one of the reasons why, uh, that was one of the reasons why there were only four of us in the end. Some of them, right. they could climb. But it is just that they cannot keep up with the time. Right, right. See, in six hours, the four of us, the four of us can, can climb from base camp to camp two in six right. hours. Right. But there were others who could only uh, reach camp one in six hours. That means they oh. need another six hours to catch right. up with us at camp two. So that was right. the... It was one of the that was one of the reasons why uh, finally there were only four of us, right? Because uh, timing is crucial. Yes. So we cannot spend too much time on the track on the trail. I see. So uh, the five of us were at camp two on the 18th late afternoon, and two of them halted at camp one on the 18th. The next day morning on the 19th morning, the other two caught up with us at camp two. And the weather became very, very bad again for the next two days. Wow. So 19, the weather was extremely bad. On the 20th, the weather was extremely bad. So we could not do anything. We, all we did was to sit around the fireplace and just warm uh, ourselves. All right. So on the 21st morning, the weather was not so good. But uh, we know if, if we don't move, chances of us submitting is going to be extremely slim. So we decided to move on. So we, so we took the chances. Uh, although the weather report says that the weather will be good later in the afternoon, uh, but we don't want to wait until afternoon. See, so we we left in the morning as early as possible. So we moved towards uh, Camp Three, and by afternoon we were already at Camp Three. And the, and and, and uh, after about eight a.m. or so local time, the sun started coming up. And, you know, it was warm and nice. So we went up to Camp 3, but uh, our camp, our tents at Camp 3 was partially buried under the snow. Wow. Because of, because of bad weather. So, of course, we had a shovel with us. So I had to shovel the snow on the slopes of uh, Mount Lhotse, uh, shovel the snow off, and then got into uh, my tent and then started preparing for the next day. So we had, uh, so now from, from camp three onwards, uh, we had to cook ourselves. We had to boil water. We, we need to collect snow and then put it into a mess tin, you know, melt the snow, make water and uh, make drinks. All right. So these are all like um, uh, easy food. You know, we just heat up the food and we just eat. So that right. was what we did. Luckily, uh, Mohan uh, has been, Dato Mohan has been my tent mate all the way through until camp three and uh since uh, he's a good cook so i had no issue with food <laughs> <laughs> on the mountain so he will do all the cooking for me you know so uh so we had some good meal and then we we slept early that that night and the next day morning got up early you know waking up you know just getting out of the sleeping tent is one of the biggest challenge every morning you know, we need to pull the zipper of the sleeping bag very slowly uh, because we uh, we don't want to knock the walls, you know, the, the, the wall of the, the, the tent because there will be a layer of frost inside the tent because it's so Ooh. cold outside right. and we are sleeping. You know, the tent is warm and we are yeah, breathing yeah. hot yeah. air out. So there will be a layer of frost inside the tent full of, you know, and if we knock... The tent, the you know, and the, the frost will just drop on us and it will be so cold. So we have to carefully, you know, unzip, you know, come out. And then while still in the sleeping bag, we need to, uh, you know, wear our climbing gears, uh, the you know, the, the, the top and the bottom. And then uh, slowly, uh, you know, uh, pull the zipper down, of, you know, and then, and then wear our climbing boots and whatnot. So uh, that, that is uh, one of the most difficult part. You know, the first step is always the most difficult every morning at, at that uh, temperature. Uh, then we started moving after some time. And uh, 
our expedition leader late uh, no ramli sulaiman he has been calling us from 4 am in the morning are you guys up <laughs> are you guys ready to move and we are still in the sleeping bag you know trying to get some sleep i <laughs> see since he could not see us so i say yeah yes yeah yeah bang kita ni tengah you know we are getting ready and what not i say so uh, finally we left camp 3 and uh, we started moving up to camp 4 it was another uh painstaking climb with so many climbers but not as many as you see these days all right but there were a long line of uh, climbers all fixed to the same uh, uh rope and uh and by afternoon by afternoon i reached camp 4 and uh, i was followed by gary chong and then soon after by fauzan so mohan uh, was still uh, on his way up so this time at camp 4 since the the uh, you know we cannot carry that many gears so we need to share uh one tent three three climbers had to share one tent so it was really really cramped so since i was there uh and i helped the sherpas to pitch the tent together with gary so uh gary uh, fauzan and myself the three of us got into a tent and while we were there in the tent mohan came and uh, since uh and uh, now he was the fourth person to to reach uh, came for he had to join the other two sherpas in another tent right right so so that was uh, in the in the afternoon of uh, 22nd uh, day of may 1997 right it was extremely windy and uh, that was about 7900 odd meters above sea level that place is also called the dead zone Okay, many climbers have died there, including a few the previous years. The previous year in 1996, you know, many climbers died. You know, in in that part of the world, uh, the wind was extremely strong, and uh, we need to prepare. So it it, it actually took a, a long time to actually heat up the water because the oxygen content there is extremely low. So without oxygen, you will only have a yellow flame from the stove and not the blue flame. because right, right. there's blue flame there's you know you know that you know the oxygen contained in the air is very very less so the right. yellow flame does not heat up the water as fast as the blue flame so it took us many um, it took us more than an hour or so just to get the water heated up you know with that kind of a uh, a weather condition so the water the water did not boil you know it it just got uh, heated up a little and then uh, we managed to have some light food and snacks uh and just rested just rested because it's it's already we are we are actually planning to move toward the summit uh, later that evening so there's no time to sleep and we need to also answer nature's call in that uh, harsh condition uh, we need to walk out of the tent and then you know we need to do our business there you know in a in a in a designated spot um and uh we you know there were other team members there as well and by by 10 something by 10 we were already preparing to to move out to the summit so the night was bright but it was extremely windy uh many of the team members from other other countries they already left we were in fact the last team to leave the to leave came came for at the time others left about 10 o'clock some even uh, uh much earlier than us so there's another thing that i must uh, share here uh when we were at base camp you know sometime in april the indonesians uh, summited everest first okay in 1997 the indonesians were the first in, in 1997 season indonesians were the first to reach the everest summit because they were already at the base camp in december 2 right so they they were there in december and they have fully acclimatized by the time the rest of the team reached base camp so they started as soon as as soon as uh, the the ladders the route through the ice fall was established the indonesians started climbing towards the summit and i think if i'm not mistaken on the 16th of april they summited everest and when they came back to the base camp they just told us that uh, you know be careful on the hillary steps because there is one dead body hanging upside down right, right? Uh, so 
uh, when when uh, when they said this, we immediately had a meeting and uh, we assigned three sherpas, you know, three climbing sherpas to move at least an hour ahead of us from Camp Four to cut the body loose from the Hillary right. steps. Right. But before, but but uh, but before our sherpas could do that, the other the other team members from uh, from other 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 countries, you know. Uh, the team led by uh, Guy Cotter from New Zealand and uh, and the other team members, they found the body first and uh, they checked the body and they cut the body loose into the ravine. So by the time our Sherpa went to the Hillary steps, you know, the body was no longer there. So they continued climbing and waited for us on the summit. So three Sherpas. So we had seven Sherpas with us, seven high altitude Sherpas with, that, with us that morning. Three left earlier, so there were four with us. And uh, as just as um, uh, we were leaving, came for Mohan had some issue with his oxygen hose. Right. Okay, had some issue, so we had to spend a little bit more time uh, to to fix it back, so that you know he can just use it because uh, uh, breathing apparatus are extremely important, and we don't have spare. If it doesn't work, we are not climbing. Right. Uh, so, uh, luckily, uh, we managed to fix that, and we started climbing. Uh, it was a very uh, slow climb, extremely slow. It was like slow motion. The the, the final stretch from K4 to the summit is is only about uh, eight hundred meters in height. Very in height, close. It's about hundred meters. Because the, 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 the summit is 8,848. Camp 4 is about 7,900 plus. Right. So there's, there's 800 odd meters you know, to cover. And it took us almost 12, 12 hours, 12 and a half wow. hours wow. To, to complete that section of the mountain. Uh, it was the, the, the hardest part of the climb. Hardest because uh, we had to spend so many hours you know, in an ex highly exposed area, the movement was extremely slow. Uh, of, of course, we had oxygen with us, but the oxygen it did not make us feel sea level. You know, it only it, it could it helped us to to be conscious of what's happening around us. Without the presence of the oxygen, probably we would be hallucinating. But with the presence of oxygen, you know, we know what was happening around. We know what are the things that we need to do, how to tackle the, the terrain. So the movement was extremely slow. And uh, every time uh, when I pause to breathe, I'll turn back to, to see if uh, Mohan is inside. All right. So it was uh, in, eventually when, when we started, it was dark. Uh, so, you know, we could only identify there's another climber at the back, you know, with your head torch. Right. And, uh, and about 100 meters after we started climbing, about 100 meters or so after we started climbing, I was already ahead of all the three of them. And uh, we all had our walkie-talkie on the front pocket, you know, of right. our suit. Uh, right. We all walkie-talkie each. So we could hear whatever they speak, the team speaks. Or what all, you know, we could hear all the communication that's that, is, uh, that was taking place. So I could hear uh, Fauzan uh, calling the base camp, you know, and telling, the, informing them that, you know, he could no longer uh, climb oh, no. because of some, some, some health issues. Right. And uh, so that's when, uh, you know, I, I just pulled out the radio and told him that, you know, uh, Fauzan, we are not very far away from you. We are just, uh, I, I, could, I could see your head touch. You know, you're not very far from here. Just, just take a break. You know, we are in this together and we want to make it together. So just take a break. You know, just rest there for about 10, 15 minutes and, and, and see if you if you can come back, if you can recover. But uh, after that, uh, he just uh, radioed and told us that, you know, uh, he, can't, he can't move on. And he has decided, he decided to, to retreat. So when right. he decided to go back to Camp 4, one Sherpa followed him. Okay, right. followed him down. Right. All right. So, so then there were three of us. So there were three of us, and we continued climbing. 
and uh, there was a point where uh, Gary was at the back of me, and uh, he was like uh, holding on to his uh, fingers, uh, of course under the gloves, under the mittens, and right. uh, and uh, he he looked as if he's having some trouble, could right, could, you know, some trouble. Uh, so uh, I asked him uh, what's happening. So he told me that you know uh, I'm I'm fine I'm fine you just uh, go ahead uh, you just go ahead. So in the dark I told him that you know the sky is already getting brighter. I could because I could see that orange line on the horizon. It right. was like uh, four or so a.m. in the morning. I could see the, wow. that that uh, orange reddish reddish line on the horizon. I said that you know the sun is already coming up, Gary. Right, right. Uh, I think uh, you know uh, uh, let's move on because we don't want to be late. Uh, right. So he said, uh, "You just go ahead. I'll catch you up at the balcony." So balcony is another. There's, there's this, you know, there's this uh, natural uh, resting spot, you know. So from the from the slope of the mountain, uh, we know we just get onto the balcony before we uh, we just uh, climb along the knife edge ridge towards the summit. Right. So so when I reached the balcony, uh, as I was about to reach the balcony, I heard. The radio call from Gary to base camp saying that you know he is uh, decided he has decided to turn back. Said that uh, so you know, close and yet. Uh, so he was like probably about 450 meters, uh, 500 meters below the summit. Right. So he said that you know he's turning back because um, uh, he could not feel his fingers. Oh no! Feel his fingers. So when he decided to turn back, uh, another Sherpa accompanied him to. Uh, came for so right. now just Mohan and me and uh, the other two Sherpas. Right. So we rested for a while at the balcony, and I started moving up towards the towards South Summit uh, before taking another break and uh, before changing to a new bottle of oxygen. So as I was climbing, the sun was up. You know, it was bright and nice. Uh, it was quite comfortable, but uh, due to the lack of oxygen as well as the altitude the movement was still at a very slow pace so we kept on uh, climbing and every time when i'm you know just stopping pause for a while to take a breather i'll turn back to see if uh, mohan is in the back and uh, <clears throat> i'll wait for a for a few seconds just to see if his head just pops out of the jagged uh, jagged ridge because the, the the terrain is a bit jagged so sometimes you know you can't really see the person at the back so so as soon as his head pops out you know from those uh, peaks you know i'll say oh yeah mohan is, mohan is <laughs> on his way up so i can continue so and then uh, i uh, when i reached south, south summit i waited there uh, and then mohan joined me on the south summit so the sherpas helped us to to uh, switch the oxygen bottles to a new bottle so with full blast of uh, oxygen into our system and uh, took some light snacks and some drink and uh, we moved on. Okay, I moved on um, and then uh, there was this uh, another challenging uh, section of the summit which is called the Hillary Steps. It took a while for me to clear the steps, you know, it was quite challenging. I had some difficulties but eventually I managed to uh, pull up, you know, myself up over the steps and I continued climbing until I reached uh, and I was closing in. As I was closing in, uh, it was cloudy, it was misty, it was a whiteout. I could not see anything beyond but there was this three Sherpas just sitting on a hillock. But before that, of course, as I was nearing the summit, I saw the other climbers who already reached the summit, they were already on the way down. So as they were going down, you know, they just cheered and they say, hey, guy, you know, hey, man, you're almost there. You know, keep on moving. You're almost there. So that, you know, actually that was a, a booster for me, you know, that that uh, kept me going and going. So as I was uh, nearing the summit, I saw the three Sherpas and I was wondering, and I was wondering to myself, uh, why are they sitting there? You know, why are they there? Uh, I could not, I, I can't see the summit, but they are there. I, and I'm not crawling, I'm, I'm not on my force. Because I had this idea 
that that you know one will probably crawl towards the summit because the indonesians did that when they came back <coughs> you know to the base camp the russian guy told us that you know they finally had to crawl to the summit so i i had that in my mind i was telling myself that i'm not crawling so that means the summit is not near yet and when i saw the three sherpas sitting there on a hill lock with a white out background i told myself that probably the you know uh, probably i'm too late you know i i could not keep up with the pace or you know uh, why are they there why aren't they waiting for me on the summit right so as i approached them i just knelt down i you know took a, a few breather and i asked how much further so one of the sherpa asked me where you where, where else do you want to go this is summit <laughs> you know and uh, as uh, as as they were saying you know the 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 clouds just lifted and it was a 360 degree view of wow. uh, of uh, you know the low mountains it was a beautiful sight it was a moment of truth i just took off my i just sat on the on the slope of the summit just pulled out my walkie talkie and uh, just called the radio called uh, uh, you know uh, came to Uh, major was there at the radio base and i told him that you know uh, this is mag and i'm calling from the summit of mount everest okay the time was 11:55 a.m in the morning and uh, wow. i could hear them cheering and they said uh, congratulations mag of course in malay uh, tania mag uh, do you realize that you know you are the first malaysian to set foot on the summit of mount everest and uh, mm. but that's that's when uh, it actually struck me that i'm actually the first malaysian to set foot on the summit uh, until then you know for my 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 only focus my only goal was to make sure that you know i reach the top and raise the flag i say and uh, after that uh, he the, the the next question was where is mohan so i told him that you know he should be joining me here on the summit anytime uh, he should be probably uh, on his way he is already uh, closing in so about 15 minutes later mohan joined me on the summit and uh, we radioed again at the, to the base camp and informed them that you know we are already on the summit of uh, mount everest uh, the, the the national flag is uh, flying here on the summit so we could hear all the cheer all the wow. cheers all the, the the voices from base camp and uh, also came to and after that it was quiet so we just said that we could not we did not actually uh, communicate you know with each other we you know it was all just expressions because we had our oxygen masks and with the goggles the, the sunglasses so it was just uh, hand signs and uh, facial expression and i just removed my oxygen mask for a while while i was on the summit to for for one or two photographs it is not like now where we have digital uh, cameras you know at the time you know there was no digital camera yeah, so you yeah. know we had to load the 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 film roll into the camera and uh, you know we had to take uh, photographs and uh, we had to wait all the way to be back to Kuala Lumpur to actually develop the films to know if <laughs> you know the photos are okay it worked until then you know it's just you know we just go around clicking right so uh, we had um, there there were six still photo cameras on the summit i had one mohan had two one was loaded with the uh, still photo a uh, still photo film and the other one was loaded with the uh, slide films the one that he had with still photo was the uh, uh, press uh, the press utusan a reporter actually gave um, three uh, still photo cameras to the sherpas to be carried to the summit to take photographs uh, initially the cameras were working but uh, later when we were on the summit while we were holding uh, the malaysian flag and uh, you know at the time the, the the cameras were all jammed up oh they no they could not take <laughs> pictures so the only camera that the, the still photo camera that worked was mine at the time so whatever cam whatever photo that was captured on the summit with the national national uh, flag the malaysian flag was all from my camera so luckily my camera worked and uh, we had a good two shots just two shots <laughs> uh, you know on the summit with the malaysian flag and that was the photo that actually appeared uh, in the national dailies uh, right right when when we came back uh, from kuala lumpur uh, when we came back from nepal so 
so that, that that's what happened. So it is not like these days where we can have uh, hundreds of uh, digital uh, photos and now we can just check the there and there to see if the photos turn well. So all that did not happen then. So we had to wait until we come back to Kuala Lumpur. But anyway, uh, the feeling of being on top of the world was uh, much, much more beautiful than uh, the, the, the view. You know, the, the feeling of realizing a Malaysian dream. I know at that point that um, thousands, uh, if not hundreds of thousands of Malaysians were actually glued to their television, uh, were waiting to see Malaysians summiting Mount Everest. Uh, so, and uh, we did not disappoint them. So the feeling of being there, the feeling of realizing a Malaysian dream was far more beautiful than the, the, the scenery that I saw from the summit. And how, how was the scenery at the summit? It was a 360 degree view of other low mountains. Uh, it's, it's not a, it's not 100% uh, clear. It was clear in certain areas because uh, much of the areas were, were blocked by thick clouds. So in between those clouds, you know, there are patches of uh, a view towards the bottom to the plains, the glaciers and, uh, you know, and other mountains. The, 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 the one that was very close to Everest was Mount Lhotse, the fourth highest mountain in the world, that is the neighboring mountain. So in fact, Camp 4, or the South Col, is actually situated on the saddle between the two mountains, the saddle of Mount Lhotse and Mount Everest, right. and then Mount Makalu, sixth highest mount, the, the fifth highest mountain, Mount Makalu was also nearby. And then uh, the, the Rangbuk Glacier, the Kangshung Glacier, uh, was also visible, was was very clear, and the, and the plains and the plateaus of the Tibetan side on the other side. So all those was visible. Uh, it was it was a view of a lifetime, and I can still How visualize the view now. How did you feel? You know, being on really on the top of the world and looking at all the mountains down there and the glaciers and all. It was uh, it was awesome and. Um, Tears just roll down, you know, tears just roll down uh, automatically. And no words, just amazed with the, the creation of God, you know, and uh, just, just being there at the rooftop of the world. Uh, that was one uh, wonderful feeling. Uh, very difficult to describe with words, but, uh, you know, that was uh, such a beautiful feeling just to be there. Awesome, awesome. So it, I mean, it's not just a dream. It was, uh, it was, it was not a, a dream of a certain group, but it was a Malaysian dream, and uh, you know, it was a pioneering feat uh, for 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 the Malaysian team. You know, uh, so it was. Uh, uh, I knew then that you know we are going to set a very good example for more Malaysians to do a lot of other things. So. It was actually a very nice feeling, uh, more so being a teacher, being a teacher, uh, facing students every day, you know, and, and, and they also know that, you know, I, I, I go off every now and then for my training, uh, training uh, towards uh, uh, Everest expedition. So they know that, you know, that I'm climbing and I'm training for, uh, for the climb, for the epic climb. Uh, I, I used to talk to them about perseverance, uh, about uh, how not to give up, uh, how to plan things. So as I was climbing towards the summit, all this, uh, you know, was, was you know, it, it kept appearing in my mind that I must make it, you know, I must make sure that, you know, I reach the summit because I cannot face my students as a person who did not reach the summit. Because otherwise, all that, that I've told them, you know, they, you know, it, it will backfire. You know, they, they, they will, I know I was afraid that, you know, they might just ask me the same question, you know, what happened to you, sir? You know, you, you, you told us a lot of things about perseverance. So what happened to you? I don't want, I don't want to face such a situation. That was one of the scariest things as I was, uh, you know, that was uh, kept bothering me as I was climbing towards the summit. Because, uh, you know, when you become successful, you know, you can prove a point. You can tell them, see, this is what I was talking to you all this time. You know, so that was uh, that was one of the things that was uh, 
that was actually uh, bothering me uh, and it was it kept coming to me you know i need to go back and face my students as a person who have reached the summit you know i want to be successful i cannot just go back and say that oh chegu sai tak dapat sampai you know i cannot do that i cannot face them with that sort of thing so that was another thing that kept me going you know until i reached the summit you know i was just about to ask you that question you know, what kept you going and what was that you know the deep driving factor because you know to do some things like this it's like a is not just an ordinary dream you have to have that you know very very deep thing uh, inside of you uh, to get through the next step and the next step and when is each step is so hard right that's right because even even uh, when we were training is initially when we started our training of course uh, we got good coverage from the local uh, uh, media <clears throat> all right of course as i mentioned to you earlier uh, there was no social media there was no uh, online thingy like what we have now but uh, you know but we got good coverage from our local press national dailies and uh, when people came to know about this project you know they were they were, they, were, they had their doubts you know they they were doubtful uh, of course we received received a lot of critics uh, and some even said that you know uh, i don't think they can even reach the base camp let alone the summit that sort of things so uh, it did not deter us so it only it only boosted us up we we told ourselves that uh, we are going to prove all these people wrong okay we are going to prove the international media wrong because there was an article in newsweek uh, sometime in may 1997 all right so in the newsweek i still have the i still have the magazine with me i still have a copy of the magazine so it was uh, uh, it was mentioned about the malaysian team being at the base camp okay and the title was gods must be angry or something <laughs> serious right? yeah gods must be angry uh, you know they 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 wrote about the malaysian team being inexperienced uh, being there at the base camp trying to summit mount everest and uh, the 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 foreign teams fear that the malaysian climbers may slow down the others from reaching the summit you know and these guys are like rock stars back home in kuala lumpur and uh, and uh, they even had lines like they even had coca cola at the base camp and that sort of thing you know uh because they this um, the many other many other critics about the malaysian team not only by the locals but also by the international media all right so so we want to prove all these people wrong so that so that was why you know the selection committee members the association and the and the ministry of indian sports made sure that this expedition is organized in a professional manner to make sure that you know every steps are taken with utmost consideration and all safety measures to just to make sure to minimize the risk uh, factor but even even so uh, we lost one life during our expedition so that's uh, that's the only setback uh, and of course uh there were other casualties uh during uh, during our time uh there at the base camp so that what is one of the one or two of the most toughest moments uh, you had during this whole climbing process all right <clears throat> climbing towards the summit was uh, and and on the way down and on the way down towards camp 4 and towards and all the way back to camp uh, to base camp uh, was um, the 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 toughest part was the toughest part because we were extremely exhausted when when uh, we used all our energy all our reserves to reach the summit when we reach the summit you know uh, uh, that is only half the battle reaching the summit flying the formulation flag is only half the battle right we still have to go all the way down to the base camp to claim victory 
so and and we also know that uh, most accidents and death happen on the way down and not on the way up so so we were extremely careful but it took us many many hours it took us about 6 hours just to clear the section between the summit and camp 4 you know just to go down usually going down is much much faster but because we were at the highest point in the world and you know it was a knife edge reach a simple mistake can be fatal so we had to be extremely careful one step at a time you know uh, and 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 uh, i wasn't sure <clears throat> at the time even if uh, because we were already extremely tired uh, and uh, since we were going down uh, we did not use much effort because the gravity is already taking us down step right. by step right so 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 even though there was uh, less oxygen content in the air but it was still okay to we were panting away but you know we could just move on and on and on towards uh, you know came four so after 6 hours i was at, uh, at in front of my in front of my tent uh, gary and fauzan uh, you know they were just waiting they were just seated there and they were just waiting for me as soon as i a rich you know rich campsite <clears throat> i had no energy to even uh, remove my ice boots you know i was just standing there i just bent over and uh, you know i was just too tired to even to pull off the shoe laces because we don't we don't tie our shoe laces like how we do here you know it, it had to be a, a date knot you know to just to make sure that you know it it just doesn't come off while we are climbing because we got no time for that you know while climbing so it was that did not so i had no energy to even to remove that so there was gary on one side and fauzan on the other side both of them helped me to remove my ice boots <laughs> <laughs> you see <clears throat> uh, so i i just went into the tent uh, i did not remove my uh, summit suit you know just remove my ice boots the crampons i just got into my sleeping bag and i just dozed off for a while <laughs> so, so that uh, that was how tired i was at the time and uh, <clears throat> then uh, they woke me up they woke me up uh, after some time to i had some tea i had some light food and then i uh, i checked on the oxygen bottle you know it was empty uh so then uh, got changed into another bottle uh so i just took the oxygen mask and then just put it into my sleeping bag just zip it up and then i went off again until the next morning so i was extremely exhausted and i did not know of course when we came back to uh, came for there were a lot of uh, calls from the base camp uh members of uh, members of our team from the base camp they were asking Uh, Fauzan and Gary about me and Mohan uh, how are they and uh, so i could just hear them saying that you know mag is already sleeping <laughs> he's already he was already in his sleeping bag and he's already sleeping he's tired you know uh, we will probably talk to you later so i could hear all that but you know i was i just did not had the energy then to you know to just rise up and to answer all those calls so i was <clears throat> and then the next morning the sherpa came into the tent and say Hey Mag, it's morning. Aren't you going to go home? Are you going to stay here? You know. <laughs> so I woke up and you know, and then I uh, got ready and then we 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 wrapped up. You know, we dismantled our tents. You know, packed up everything. And uh, some of our Sherpas from uh, Camp Two came up to Camp Four at the time to clear the campsite, and we then we left. And uh, it was another very very tiring journey from Camp Four to Camp Two. so by then uh, two other guys who were stationed at camp 2 uh zaidi paiman and murthy just left they left in the morning so only major the climbing leader was there uh, waiting for us at camp 2 so as soon as we reached camp 2 you know uh, but this time i did not i did not uh, i i i had energy so i did not go to sleep immediately so you know we just changed into our uh, lighter gears and then uh, we just uh, had some chit chat you know at the kitchen tent uh, by the fire talking about about you know what what happened the previous day 
uh, and uh, we also plan to to close down the the, the campsite at Camp Two, and uh, so we also communicated with those at camp uh, at, at base camp, and they told us that you know they are sending more Sherpas up from base camp to Camp Two the following morning for us to uh, unpack, uh, dismantle all the tents, and, re- and and transport all the gears back to base camp. So that's what happened the next day. Uh, on the on the twenty fifth morning, so uh, it took us. It was probably the longest journey. It was probably the longest journey from camp to to base camp. You know, it took us eleven hours. You know, it was the movement was extremely slow, and uh, uh, the other thing that made the the movement slow was there was uh, an accident happened. A sherpa fell into a crevasse. You know, at the Kumbu ice fall. So, so by the time we reach the Kumbu Ice Fall, you know, they were actually the the there were other Sherpas and uh, foreigners uh, trying to rescue the Sherpa who fell into the crevasse. Uh, uh, his limbs were broken, but he was alive. So he was uh, taken and then uh, put him on a, onto a stretcher, and uh, they had to carry the stretcher through this ice fall and through all these aluminium ladders. You know, it was uh, it was. Uh, <clears throat> uh, very very slow process because they had to be careful because they don't want to drop the body the, the 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 injured person into another crevasse so they had to be extremely careful so that was another reason why it took us so long for us to travel from camp to to base camp as soon as we reached base camp you know the team members were just waiting we all hugged and we all cried and uh, and that's when uh, we could actually claim a victory of summiting Mount Everest. That was another beautiful moment uh, that evening on the 25th May. And when when was it uh, that you all spoke? To, because we all, I mean, a lot of us were watching that the whole thing live, right? Uh, when was the moment that you spoke to Tun Dr. Mahate uh, at that point of time? Was it at the peak when you all, you know, radioed down to uh, base uh, 4? Mm. No, uh, actually, we did not speak to Thun. Okay. Okay. Uh, we were told by the RTM crew members that you know they are we, they will try to connect us from the summit to the prime minister who was in London at the time. All right, but uh, something went wrong with the communication. Uh, so. Tone could only speak to those who were at the base camp and not right, to those right. who were at the summit. So Tone actually spoke to some of them who were at the base camp. And uh, uh, Tone, uh, did the prime minister did ask if he could speak to those at the summit because I didn't know all this then. Yeah, I only yeah. knew all this. I came back to Kuala Lumpur and watched it, you know, uh, the recorded program. So uh, he, he actually wanted to speak to those who... <clears throat> were on the summit, but because of some communication pro- problems, he could not speak to us. He spoke to those on uh, at the base camp. Uh, so that's what happened. Right. But we did so, speak to the sports minister. We did speak to the sports minister that evening from the base camp. Right. So what is what is one uh, the one like you know like this whole uh, experience? Uh, what is the some of the key things that you remember? You know some of your learning points uh, in this whole climb. All right, this is about uh, it's it's uh, the 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 whole process you know project Malaysia Malaysia Everest ninety seven project. Okay, it is not just one person's dream. Right, it, it's 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 a dream that has been passed on from one generation to another generation of climbers. Okay, the early members of the association who actually wanted to climb Everest, you know, they 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 mooted the idea of climbing Everest, and uh, you know, it was uh, carried on from one person to another uh, without without greed. You know, uh, the, the 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 point, the ambition was to put a Malaysian flag on the summit. So it was passed on. So uh, it's about uh, being focused. I learned about being focused. I learned about having concrete goal, irrespective of uh, who is going to be there. 
in the final days to accomplish that mission. Okay, everybody worked towards the same goal, the same interest. Uh, although only the two of us managed to reach the summit in the end, but it was still a team effort, right? So uh, we learned about uh, teamwork, how important each and every member of the team is, you know, how uh, each and everyone played their part to make the whole things successful. Uh, it's about uh, commitment. You know, how committed each and every member has to be to pull in, to pull through a project as big as this. You know, it has taken many years. It was a painstake, painstaking uh, a waiting, but eventually we accomplished just because we were all committed in our own ways towards uh, realizing that, uh, that goal. Uh, it was about... Uh, Confidence. Okay, we, we, we were confident, you know, uh, that, that we can achieve uh, what we had worked for all this while. Uh, we did not easily gave, gave away, uh, gave up to all those critics. Of course, uh, there were many questions thrown, thrown to us. Because when, uh, when uh, the government is getting involved in such a huge project, when the government is uh, channeling uh, a huge amount of fund, of course, they, they had their questions because, you know, it is, it is not just anyone's money, but it is the people's money. Yeah. Okay. So money has to be spent wisely. Uh, so there were a lot of questions that need to be answered. And uh, we did not just uh, shy away, but we were confident, that, you know, with, with the right commitment, uh, we can become successful. And uh, uh, we were consistent throughout all those trying times. You know, we, were, we, we, had, we had no funds coming in. Uh, we had to come up, uh, think of uh, some ways to, to, to keep on training, uh, whatever way it is, you know, either to take up a bank loan or to borrow money from somebody or, you know, to just fight your credit card away. So, you know, so we were constantly on it, you know, from day one until we accomplish the mission. So these are some of the things that I learned, you know, things that uh, I did not learn when I was in school. I did not learn when I was in college, but the mountain, the mountain, the harsh terrain, the, 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 the programs that I went through, the mountains that I've climbed has taught me a, a life's lesson that I could not have possibly learned anywhere else. Amazing, amazing. It's truly amazing. So just for all our friends who have been with us uh, in this uh, live session with Dato Mac, thank you so much, Dato Mac. Uh, if you want to have you know, any last questions that you have, if you want to throw it out, uh, please do so. If you want to just say bye uh, to Dato Mac, uh, to you know, well wish him, uh, you know, just do the last shout out here because we are finishing up soon. Uh, so, Dato Mac, what uh, have you climbed on any other mountains after this big historical climb? Right. I have been climbing. I have been climbing. Uh, of course, uh, Mount Kinabalu is my yearly, yearly, yearly thing. I don't just climb mountains, but I also take students and... Uh, Anyone who wants to climb with me up um, Mount Kinabalu every year, I make it a point to climb Kinabalu at least once a year. Sometimes I, I, I have done uh, uh, more than twice, uh, you know, three times in a year, but at least once. But this year, because of MCO, I, we could not uh, climb Kinabalu. So we will see if we can make it next year. Uh, that's one thing that I've been doing. Uh, I, I am not only climbing, but I also incorporate other elements into climbing. Initially, it was just exposing students and uh, youth to climbing activities. So after some time to make it more interesting, I started introducing uh, other elements into climbing like a mountain conservation program, you know, how to conserve nature. Uh, what are the things that we can do to uh, make sure that we take care of these mountains for our future generation of climbers. 
you know, that like like Mount Kinabalu, there are uh, plants, flora and fauna that are only found on Mount Kinabalu and nowhere else in the world. All right. So uh, so we need to take care of those uh, uh, indigenous plants so that our uh, our future generation of climbers will also be able to see what we are seeing today. Because these indigenous plants are slowly vanishing, uh, part, partially due to global warming and uh, also due to excessive trekking on the mountain. Okay, so this, um, th there is this um, invasive plant that is uh, growing wildly on Mount Kinabalu. It is called the dandelion. You know, it is, it is a plant that actually originated from Europe. You know, it could have probably, uh, you know, brought into Mount Kinabalu by European uh, foreign uh, trekkers because, uh, you know, outdoor enthusiasts, when they, when they travel, they wear their trekking boots all the time. Yeah. And uh, yeah. this, this seed of this plant could have stuck to their climbing boots. And, you know, so when they were climbing uh, Mount Kinabalu, probably the seed, you know, has just loosened up from the trekking, trekking shoe and, you know, Probably that could be, that, that is one of the theory uh, that I have heard, you know, while I was there in uh, the Kinabalu region, how this plant that was found in Europe is here and growing wild. And it is actually invading all the other plants, you know, that are, that are found only in Mount Kinabalu. So sometimes we join this group of people from Sabah to just uproot these plants. But this plant is just growing rapidly then. And, and uh, you know, a lot of actions are needed you know, to, to make sure that, you know, we keep Mount Kinabalu the way it is for our future gener generation of climbers. So these are some of the things that I I include in my climbing, not just climbing, but also to all think about uh, other uh, conservation programs as well. Besides that, uh, we also made plans to climb Mount Everest again. I was just about to ask you this. Yeah, in, in 2012, <clears throat> we were planning... We were planning, we actually, we started uh, this uh, program in 2008. Uh, we got a group of climbers, all, all government servants this time, 100% government servants, civil servants. Uh, we, we went to uh, Nepal a few times. Uh, we climbed a few peaks, including uh, the highest during this time was uh, Highland Peak. It's about 6,900 odd meters above sea level but unfortunately uh, we could not go on with the program because uh, being civil servants all of us our leave application was rejected uh, so none of us were willing to go on no pay leave for at least two and a half months to three months because with all our heavy commitments yeah there's no way we can uh, just go off to climb a mountain uh, without being paid. So on that circumstances, uh, majority of them, almost all of them, uh, decided not to continue with the program. Uh, eventually, there was only one person. There was only one person who said that no problem. Uh, since I'm a contract staff, I am uh, willing to resign and uh, climb Everest. So what we did, uh, we managed to get all of... Uh, an NGO, outdoor association. Uh, we managed to get a few guys from there, a, a few members from there, pull them into this program and uh, made up a very small team of uh, five climbers. And uh, they were sent to Nepal, but unfortunately nobody submitted Everest. Uh, so that was, the, that, was, uh, that, that was what happened in 2012. So this one climber, he managed to climb up to uh, 8,400 or 500 meters, but he could not wow. summit. Uh, he could not so summit. Close up the, the summit. Yes, he was, I think, of uh, 400 meters off the summit. Wow. So he could not, uh, he could not uh, summit Everest. So that was, uh, that was uh, what we did. Of course, given a chance, I would love to climb, but... Uh, Probably I had to wait until I retire because I cannot <laughs> afford to. I cannot afford to go on no pay leave. That I cannot do. Yeah. 
is such a big adventure. Yeah, that's right. All right. So uh, I think we are coming up to the end of the show. Uh, Dato Mac, thank you so much for your sharing. I think it's truly inspiring. A uh, lot of friends here, if you see in the comments here, uh, there's, you know, everyone has, uh, your sharing has actually made a great impact uh, today uh, to a lot of people who are actually watching. In fact, a lot of people are inspired by your story uh, of your climb, you know, the struggle, uh, and then ultimately uh, triumph, having the triumph of climbing the peak. Uh, it's it's just amazing. I mean, I'm I'm just here listening to you, and it's you know just gives me goosebumps. And look at the Everest mountain at the back. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> right, because so, I didn't realize that you know we have been uh, talking for about two hours now. Yeah, it just the 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 time just flew, you know, and you know the details that we've been giving. I think it's just wonderful. Uh, some of them have shared. Uh, some of them, some of them here are actually climbers themselves. Like, for example, like Palani, uh, he said, as and Sivanis, they said, like as you were sharing your experience, uh, they were feel feeling like they were climbing the mountain themselves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. right? Thank you, thank you. All right. So uh, uh, we have a lot of friends here who have you know said, uh, you know, you are really a hero. Uh, and uh, to a lot of Malaysians here, uh, thank you so much on behalf of everybody for being on the show and sharing your experience. I hope to see you again sometime in another show. And uh, please continue inspiring everyone here in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vyasa. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your, on your uh, con conversation matters. Yes. So with that, bye-bye, right. everyone. I'll see, we'll see you again Thank in you another folks. show. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.